want you to join the new unit, John, as deputy director. That's a compliment, Professor Kostelitz. Thank you. <laughs> Not so much a compliment as selecting the right man for the job. <laughs> One of my intentions for the new unit is to form a team to isolate and identify the endogenous opiate that morphine imitates. Oh, the isolation of the brain's natural morphine. Yes. But suppose it doesn't exist. What is science, if not the search for something that may not exist? It's a theory. Soundly based. From the way morphine acts, it must respond to a specific receptor. And why should the body have a specific receptor for morphine? When nature couldn't possibly predict man producing it from poppies? Morphine must imitate a natural chemical already in the brain. This chemical must have the same effects as morphine, providing pain relief, highs of pleasure, ecstasy, and is probably non-addictive. Perhaps we could unlock the whole key to addiction. Well, what you just saw was a bit of a, a British uh, film documentary, uh, not, not docudrama, done by Thames Television, um, based on my book. That's, the, that's kind of the story, you know, that's, that's the beginning of the story of the discovery of endorphins. Because in 1973, um, John, the real John Hughes is, this guy here. And the real Professor Hans Kosterlitz is this guy here. And in 1973, they were, John was going to the slaughterhouse in Aberdeen, and he had a push crate bicycle with some ice in it. He'd go there every day, and he'd give the butchers a bottle of whiskey, and they would give him the, the pig's heads and the brains contained therein. And he would take the brains, back to the lab and mush them up and make this soup. And in that soup, they were hoping to find the, the brain's own morphine. Because it had to be there, because it had to be there. Because these guys over here, this is uh, Candace Pert and Solomon Snyder. They were, they were at, the, at Johns Hopkins University in, in Baltimore. And the year before that, in 1972, they'd found receptors in, in, the, in nerve systems that reacted specifically with opiates. So, so there was this, this uh, complex of molecules in the, already in the body, and when a narcotic drug came, it just like latched on, just like a key fitting a lock. So as pr the professor was saying, I mean, there had to be something naturally that would do that. There had to be a natural key for that lock. It didn't make sense that it would just be f there for poppy juice. So uh, Candace and, and Solomon Snyder had discovered this receptor, and, and Kosterlitz and Hughes were, were working on it. And I, I just want to say a word about Candace. Um, her, I mean, I mean, look at, this is, the, <laughs> this is the International Narcotics Research Club. These are, the, this is all, these are all the people that were pursuing this discovery. Um, and with one possible exception, she was the only one there that had any sex appeal at all, you know? I mean, I just, here, here and, and I just want to just read you just a little section to, to whet your appetite, and, and then we'll get back to the story, because, but, Here's the way I described her in the book. When Candace Pert arrived at Johns Hopkins in the fall of 1971, she began painting rainbows everywhere. Rainbows, she believed, meant good fortune. Pictures of rainbows eventually swathed her lab bench and even occasionally decorated her toes in swirls of red, yellow, black, and white polish. Though she was only 24 uh, when she arrived, the signs were already apparent, as surely as the rainbows, that there had never been anyone quite like Candace Pert in the sciences before. I mean, she's kind of, I mean, in the story, she's the 
supporting, the winner of the supporting actress role, and definitely the only one of these guys I, I ever kissed. Um, anyway, there were a couple of standard tests to, to test the, the strength of narcotic drugs. And um, one was the, called the guinea pig ileum. Everybody has an ileum. It's the, very la it's the last little segment of your uh, small intestine leading into your large intestine. And basically, it twitches. It, 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 it twitches, it throbs, it quivers, it, 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 creating peristalsis that moves food along down into your guts. And the other one is the mouse vas deferens. Um, <laughs> which is right here, um, vasectomy. The, the vas deferens is this little tube that carries sperm, you know, to the uh, urethra, and you know, in, in preparation for ejaculation. So it also twitches, quivers, throbs, and 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 uh, twitches, <laughs> twitches, quivers, and throbs. It contracts when when it's stimulated by electricity. So in addition to having to harvest these pig brains every day, John Hughes also had to vasectomize a lot of mice to, so that he could put them into this apparatus in saline solution, you know, and they would apply a little electric charge. And went, beep, 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 You know, like this, this is over here is a vas deferent being stimulated electronically, you know, so it, it's doing what it should do. Bam, add some morphine. <laughs> what happens? It, go, it stops. But if you, it just stops. And it, but if you, add, if you put in this morphine antagonist called naloxone, which is what they use to bring addicts out of over, overdoses, boing, it starts again. It starts quivering and throbbing again. So, um, I mean, that, this, is, this is what he was doing. He was taking little samples of pig brain, whoop, of pig brain, dropping them onto the vas deferens as it twitched and seeing would he get anything similar to morphine. Would it stop? Could it be reversed? And, and after a couple of years, they found it. They found uh, a sequence of five amino acids that um, they named enkephalin in the head, and the term endorphin came a little later. By then, they'd expanded out to a team of uh, six um, because there, there were many, all very complex processes that had to be done in order to really know what they had here. And, and they published a paper in Nature in 1975, and it was so important. I mean, it was, it was such big news that they were invited to present their results before the Royal Society, which is like the most prestigious thing that can happen to a scientist in England uh, at the Conversazione, you know, in, in, in 1976. So here, is, here are the guys, really glamorous, you know, like all decked out in their tuxedos and, you know, making their presentation. So, um, you can read a lot more about this in, in my book, Anatomy of a Scientific Discovery. It talks about the, the, the whole journey to discovery, the competition, how the drug companies got involved and were backing various teams. But that's not why we're here. We'll do that later. The interesting thing is that after a point, after the original molecule was discovered, they began to see it had connections to all kinds of stuff to drug addiction, to runner's high, appetite, mental illness. You know, they thought maybe there was either, either endorphins could cure schizophrenia or maybe they caused it, depression, they looked at that. And sexual response. <laughs> I mean, how appropriate. Um, there was, the, the, the speculation about sex and endorphins was controversial. Basically, the scientists were a lot like, you know, a, a couple, you know, there was a lot of disagreement, there was disappointment, there was confusion. They weren't quite making this connection that they thought must surely be there. But the problem was basically this. I, I mean, look, I mean, if this is, this is you know, morphine, Stops all the throbbing, quivering, and twitching. You know, I mean, <laughs> why wouldn't endorphins did the same? 
I mean, this is not exactly like a stimulant. It's not, it's not a, it doesn't look like an aphrodisiac. I mean, take away the twitch, quiver, and throb, and what is sex after all? You know, so. um, and besides that, I mean, you don't have to be a neuroscientist to know that even though the euphoria of opiates may be wonderful and powerful, um, you know, junkies nodding on the street just don't appear to have much libido. Um, so, <laughs> so the potential, the potential of uh, you know of endorphins as an aphrodisiac seemed rather low. But any that did, that did not, it did not stop the scientists from pressing on. They looked at animals, um, and. In Sweden, they gave male mice, you know, little shots of endorphin, and they put them in a cage with receptive females. And they, what they saw was really strange. The mice would, mice would approach the female, and they do their whole little precopulary dance. They had all their moves, but when it came time to mount, they didn't. They just kind of like lost interest. And and, and those that did mount, those that did mount. Um, they also, they, they said, this was a bit abnormal. They said they had no real clasp or thrust. And thus, there was no intromission in the <laughs> by those mice. Um, on the other hand, if you gave my, mice naloxone, there was more mounting and more intromission. And basically, so, so it really looked like you know maybe maybe an overabundance of endorphin was was causing impotence or sexual dysfunction and then so then this kind of crazy guy in Boston decided to go for it and he uh, gave naloxone to a bunch of horny college guys and they said whoa man I'm really I'm really horny now you know so he he, he recorded he reported that. Their, their libido had gone up even higher than it was. And he said, well, you know, so then the, then the speculation really started that, you know, maybe there was something here, you know, for male impotence, possibly. Unfortunately, uh, th this is Avram Goldstein. He was this, one of the fathers of endorphin research, and he's talking to a very good looking young reporter there. Um, Goldstein said, you know, he was a, like the a scientific version of a strict constructionalist. You know, he, he just, he wanted, you know, he felt that all this data, you know, was just, he said, a magical mystery tour. And that there couldn't be any connection. And so he decided to disprove it by doing a, a, an experiment of his own. So what he did for 12 weeks, um, he had, he had a, a male subject you know, a volunteer subject come in in a very private office, and he shot him up with naloxone and then told him to masturbate. And, but, you know, to make it really scientific, you know, he didn't want any, any kind of possible things brought into the, well, so there was no porn magazines, no, you know, no videos, no nothing like that. On the other hand, he was really worried that the guy might, you know, have a side effect. So the guy had to buzz every minute while he was doing this to assure Avram that everything was cool, you know. And he was supposed to record the exact time of full erection and the exact time of ejaculation. And then was, he was supposed to note on a, on a little survey, was this worse? Was it the same? Or was it better than it's ever been before? Well, not surprisingly, the guy said it was no different. Well, maybe surprisingly, he said it was no different. He didn't say it was worse. He just said no different. And Goldstein rushed this article, Evidence Against Involvement of Endorphins and Sexual Arousal. He, he rushed it into print in the archives of general psychiatry. And that more or less killed the endorphin as aphrodisiac theory. So the wonderful thing about you know, getting this you know, afterglow is that you can do it anytime, anywhere. You don't have to be naked, or you can be. 
Once you know where your E spot is, that's why we're here, folks. That's why we're here. We're not here to talk about science. We're talking, like, where, where is my E spot? I want to turn this shit on, you know? Right? That's why we're here. That's why we're here. And I'm going to tell you where it is and show you how to do it. <clears throat> but before we do, we have to back up a little bit, like just a little more science. And this part of the science has to do with this kind of strange question. What do Keith Richards, uh, Pete Townsend, and Boy George have in common, but besides that they're all rock stars? They're all British. That's interesting. They're all male. But what they really have in common is this woman, Dr. Meg Patterson, and her fabulous black box device. Because thanks to Meg Patterson, you know, they, well, she put this device on them. It's a transcutaneous nerve stimulator, um, which we actually see more of now for things like arthritis. It, it, it pulses a current through electrodes onto uh, sensitive spots in your body. And so what she would do, this is not an orgone box. No, this is a TNS device. Uh, I mean, basically, it's an endorphin machine. TNS standing for? Uh, transcutaneous nerve stimulation. So basically, this is an endorphin machine. And, and, and she would and put, and, and put, you know, if she put the electrodes on the E-spot, stimulated it 24-7 for a few days, that is what? cured Boy George, Keith Richards, and Pete Townsend, even though they had gargantuan heroin habits. They went to her. They, they detoxed with her, yes. They all detoxed with Margaret Patterson. Yeah. Um, I mean, basically, this, this is electroacupuncture. Um, and electroacupuncture, in every, there was no controversy about this. It definitely produced endorphins. And, and to tell you the truth, I know somebody who built himself one of these things in order to detox. Different than like TENS? Or it is TENS. It is TENS. It is TENS. Yeah. Only difference is where do you put the electrodes? Yeah. And then get some TENS and just be like... So, yeah, so it's electroacupuncture. And the, the point, the acupuncture point, where they put these electrodes. Let me guess, let me guess, let me guess. All right, you're going to, it's gonna called guess. by the ancient Chinese physicians, called it the san jiao, or triple heater, or triple warmer. And is it called triple heater because it's three points, or because it's triply? It's powerful. triply powerful, I think, but and they call it the three burning spaces. Oh, uh, so, Can we guess before where's the e spot? Where do you think, huh? I'm going right here. Okay. I think it's a thymus. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to guess? It's Wait, is it. one spot are men and women equal? Both, but equal, <laughs> equally. Um, I, yeah. think it's, I think it's stem. Is stem. it related? Well, it would be too obvious to be a toxic point. Well, well, it's, it's not, not too obvious. obvious. Uabanga. It's in the Uabanga. Well, okay, guys. Here it is. It's here. It's here behind the ear. Um, and both, e both ears have it. Huh? I don't know. You get eargasm? <laughs> so... So now, now, now it's showtime. Now, now, I'll show you where it is, and, and you can pair up. And, and well, I would suggest trying it on yourself first, just to locate the right area. Well, you, it's sensitive. It's sensitive. You feel it now? A little indent, like where there doesn't, there's no bone. Here, it's like right here. Okay. And, and then you can reverse it. You can reverse it. So what is that? Is that 
This is stimulating your E spot. So, so the, endor the endorphins, I mean, the, the meridian for this spot goes from behind your ear, it goes up through the pituitary and hypothalamus, where not only endorphins, but everything else are produced to the front of the brain, where, where you begin to recognize the perception. So it, it's, it's kind of a, a head trip, but it does flow down the arms as well. So, so try it at home. <laughs> um, I hope you're a little happier than when you came in. Um, you know, try it at home. The, you know, it's like sex itself. The more you do, the better it gets. Thank you. Yeah.